Pops and bangs from anti-lag systems are some of everyone's favorite rally car sounds, but what about the sound of a fully spooled turbo at idle? How is that even possible? Back in the prime of Subaru's WRC program, the S11 and S12 rally cars were equipped with one of the coolest and most efficient anti-lag systems ever devised. Today, we're talking about the system dubbed Rocket Anti-Lag. We'll go over exactly how it worked, what made it unique, bust some common myths about the system, and hopefully do it all in a way that just about anyone can understand. So let's get into it. Before we get to the Rocket, we need to lay down some background knowledge first. Feel free to skip ahead if you already know this stuff. Hopefully, you already know how turbochargers work, but if you don't, a turbocharger compresses intake air by using exhaust gas to spin a turbine wheel. The more we compress the air going into the engine, the more boost we make, and the more power we can make. The next concept we need to understand is turbo lag. WRC cars have fairly sizable turbos that need a lot of exhaust gas to spin fast enough to make boost. If a driver gets out of the throttle, the engine burns less fuel and makes less exhaust gas, meaning that we don't have the exhaust flow needed to keep making boost. When the driver gets back on the gas, they'll notice a delay between the time they step on the pedal and the time it takes for the turbo to come back up to speed. That delay is turbo lag. Turbo lag affects the drivability of a car and is especially problematic for rally cars where the driver needs on-demand power to control the car on difficult surfaces. This is where anti-lag systems come in. The main goal of an anti-lag system is to keep the turbocharger spinning fast enough to produce boost by causing combustion in the exhaust manifold when the driver is off throttle. That's where all the cool noises come from. So how do we do that? Well, we need three things for combustion. Air, fuel, and spark. So anti-lag is really just a matter of moving those three things from the engine's cylinders to the exhaust manifold. There's a couple common ways of doing this that we'll take a look at. The first is sometimes referred to as a throttle bypass or a throttle kick system. There's a few things we need to do to make it work. The first is to crack the throttle open just a little bit to still allow some airflow into the cylinders on the intake stroke. The second is to add a little bit more fuel than usual. And the third is to slow down the firing of the spark plug so that it happens when the piston is already moving down during the combustion stroke. What ends up happening on the exhaust stroke is that part of the air fuel mixture still hasn't combusted because we delayed our spark and it makes its way into the exhaust manifold. Combustion spreads from the cylinder into the exhaust manifold, which produces a pressure spike that keeps the turbo spinning. In simpler terms, we normally only explode things in the cylinder, but now we're exploding things in our exhaust manifold too. As you might imagine, this method is pretty rough on our turbo and manifold, but that's not its only drawback. If we want anti-lag aggressive enough to keep the turbo near full boost, we need to open the throttle quite a bit, which means the engine is still making a fair amount of torque. Imagine trying to slow down for a corner, but the engine keeps pulling you forward while you're out of the gas. Even the best drivers in the world would be confused. So we know that running too much air through the engine during anti-lag can make for some drivability issues. So what if we route the air around the engine instead? This is a system sometimes referred to as an air injection system or fresh air system. It works by doing the same things as before with fuel and spark, except now we have piping that routes compressed air directly from our turbo to a valve connected to the exhaust manifold. This valve can be precisely controlled by our ECU via a solenoid, which presents a couple advantages. Not only did we eliminate the torque surge from the other system, but we can also control exactly how much air enters the exhaust manifold, giving us more control over the combustion and how much we keep the turbo spinning. This type of system was common on WRC cars, until they recently banned it in Rally 1. Alright, enough of the elementary school stuff, let's get on with why you clicked on this video. The Rocket. Surely a boost secret this good is closely guarded by Samurai or something, right? Turns out ProDrive patented it, and the patent is available online, but it's also over 5,000 words, and I doubt most of you want to read it, so I've gone ahead and read it for you. We'll start with the first diagram in the patent. We've got our engine right here, our turbo here, an air valve here, and last but certainly not least, the rocket. I'm not sure why it's called that, because it doesn't work like a rocket engine at all, but I guess it kind of looks like a rocket. Anyway, the engine runs like any other normal turbo engine, until we want anti-lag. 
When we need anti-lag, the engine runs more fuel rich so that some unburnt fuel is carried with our exhaust gas into the rocket. At the same time, we open our air valve which lets intake air that's already been compressed by the turbo also flow into the rocket. Lastly, our rocket is going to be hot enough that ignition can occur without the need for a spark plug, so we've got all three ingredients needed for combustion. Simple enough, but what's going on inside the rocket and how the combustion actually occurs is where it gets interesting and a little more complicated. So we've got our exhaust gases along with the unburnt fuel they're carrying coming in through here. We have our compressed intake air from the turbo entering here, and this end is connected up to the exhaust side of the turbocharger. Let's start with the anatomy of the rocket. First off, there's two main sections. We have this inner section here, where our exhaust flows through, and then this outer pocket area here that our intake air can flow throughout. We've also got all of these holes that let intake air enter the inner section from the outer pocket. We have some diagonal tubes that also let air in, and we have a central tube that takes air from the outer pocket and flows it this way. So let's step through the combustion process. As our exhaust carrying unburnt fuel enters the rocket, it mixes with intake air entering through these holes. This is what initially starts the combustion process. Our mixture is already combusting as it flows down into the center section where it's time for these diagonal tubes to come into play. These are referred to as air inlet pipes in the patent and their job is to inject air into the chamber in a swirling motion. And according to the patent, there are set up burning toroidal vortices of gas and air within the annular region. Don't worry, it sounds more confusing than it is. Picture a donut made out of our combusting gas moving along the rocket, except the flow of the gas around the donut is actually following this shape. This is known as a vortex ring and is the same principle that these cannon toys work off of. Because of the rotational movement of the vortex ring, we have lower pressure in the middle of the ring we reduce friction between the ring and the surrounding air. And here's the important part. The vortex ring can travel a long distance with little loss in energy. So as our combusting vortex rings work their way down the rocket, we also have air flowing through the center tube that mixes with them and helps to both move the rings along and add oxygen to keep the combustion going. So as the patent puts it, we end up with a high velocity stream of gases discharging through the outlet and into the turbo. Rather than irregular explosions in our exhaust manifold to violently spool our turbo like the other anti-lag systems we talked about, we have a steady, consistent stream of gas coming out of the rocket like thrust from a jet engine, and ideally, a sustained flame inside of the rocket to keep things going. And don't forget, we can control exactly how much thrust we have from the rocket with our air valve. But wait! There's more! These holes don't just help our mixture stay oxygenated, they also flow air along the edges of the rocket, which does a couple of things. For one, it insulates and protects the metal. The entire rocket is made out of Inconel, so it has a pretty high melting point, but we're still concerned with the longevity of the whole assembly, considering how complex it is to fabricate. The air also cools the rocket as it flows downstream, meaning that our exiting exhaust gas temperatures end up being less than other anti-lag systems, which as you can imagine, helps preserve the lifespan of our turbo. Lastly, the air layers create a nice barrier for the flame in the middle of the rocket and prevent it from being extinguished. So long story short, we've got a stream of gas like thrust from a jet engine that we can precisely control to spin up our turbo however much we want and whenever we want. Pretty neat. So now that we know how it works, let's bust some common myths surrounding the rocket. The rocket itself is not a jet engine, but it does work very similarly to the section of a jet engine where combustion occurs, known as a combustor. The main difference being that jet engine combustors have their own internal fuel injection and ignition systems, whereas the rocket needs neither of those. Also keep in mind that a combustor in a jet engine will be igniting an air-fuel mixture to create the reaction, whereas the rocket is igniting intake air mixed with fuel-rich exhaust gas. A lot of people seem to think that Subaru's rocket system had a boost storage tank, like the Ford Focus we covered in a previous video, where it would store excess boost that it could dump back into the intake. I never worked on Subaru's rally team, but I don't think that's true. I also don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars to blow on a Subaru rally car to prove it to you, but what I do have is an internet connection, some engine bay photos, and a service diagram I found to illustrate what I'm getting at. 
This tank here is what a lot of people seem to mistake for a boost storage tank. Let's take a closer look at it. We've got two airlines, one which connects to the wastegate of the turbo, and another which disappears underneath the tank. My best guess though is that it connects to the intercooler piping right here. We also have three solenoid valves here, and a sensor wire, which if we read what it connects to, says W gate P. I've been wrong before, but that has to mean wastegate pressure. So really what we probably have is a boost control system. Compressed air pressurizes our tank from the intercooler piping. The ECU reads the pressure sensor, and depending on what's going on, uses the solenoid valves to control exactly how much pressure the wastegate is seeing. For the uninitiated, a wastegate is simply a valve that controls how much exhaust gas spins our turbo versus how much of it exits straight through the exhaust. Just because we can have full boost all the time with the rocket doesn't mean we want to, so the ECU has control over our wastegate with this system and can allow as much or as little rocket gas as we want to spool the turbo. At the same time, remember we have full control over our air valve to the rocket and can control exactly how much air enters it. This type of precise control is what makes the system so efficient when it's properly tuned and calibrated. But you can see how smart ProDrive's engineers had to be to get everything dialed in perfectly. Even though it's a cool party trick to sit idling with your turbo fully spooled up, systems like the air injection kind we mentioned at the start of the video are much simpler from a control standpoint and also don't need a precision fabricated Inconel rocket tube to work, which is probably why we don't hear too much about rocket systems anymore. One last bonus myth. This video has gone around of a mechanic using an air pump on a reservoir in the car's engine bay, and a lot of people think it has to do with the anti-lag system. It's hard to see in this photo, but if we look at these photos of an older engine bay, we can see a reservoir connected to the cooling system that's equipped with the same valve he connected his pump to. All he's likely trying to do is raise the pressure in the car's cooling system. The more we can increase the pressure of the liquid in the system, the higher its boiling point, and the better it can do its job at the extreme temperatures seen in a WRC engine. Sorry to burst any bubbles, but it doesn't look like this has anything to do with the rocket. So if you made it this far, leave a comment and give yourself a round of applause because that was a lot of fairly technical stuff to get through. Hopefully you enjoyed learning about one of the coolest systems of anti-lag to ever see competition. Check out this video next, and of course, subscribe for more. Thanks for watching.